Welcome to Butte County Library's Adult Summer Reading Program. Today we are excited to introduce David Welch, who's going to be giving you tips on how to tune up your bike for your summer adventures. Thanks for being here, David. I'm happy to be here. I think we'll have fun. The, um, I'm actually, the original request, as Katie says, was to talk about how to tune up a bike. We're gonna go a little bit beyond that. We're gonna kind of talk about sort of the basic repair and maintenance that an ordinary person can do with not too much in the way of special tools to uh, keep your bicycle in good shape and operating well and make sure that it's safe to ride. We certainly will do some tuning up, but we're going to also uh, show some simple part replacements and some things like that as we go along. Um, before I get into that though, I would be remiss if I didn't slip in just a few words about bicycling safety. I'm what's called a league cycling instructor. That means I've been certified by the League of American Bicyclists to teach what they call smart cycling, which you could also call safe and efficient bicycling. And um, so uh, there's a lot of information online that the League has. If you uh, do a little online search for smart cycling, you'll find lots of information on their pages and some really good videos. But just for a couple of basic words before we get into the mechanical stuff. Uh, cyclists do best on the road, we're safest when we think and act like the operator of a motor vehicle or of a vehicle. Um, the, um, some cyclists make the mistake of trying to think and act like a pedestrian and that really isn't the way to do it. So as the operator of a vehicle, we have the same rights and responsibilities on the road as other vehicle operators. So you ride in the street, not on the sidewalk, you ride with traffic, not facing traffic. Um, you signal your intentions when you're going to change lanes or make a turn. You obey stop signs and stop lights and uh, try to ride predictably, riding in a straight line and again signaling your intentions when you're going to make changes. And that will make you more respected by other road users and help to keep you safer. Also a really good idea when you're cycling to wear a helmet and a helmet that is properly adjusted so that it sits flat on your head relatively, not tilted way back so it leaves your forehead exposed. And um, there are, most all modern helmets have a little adjuster, size adjuster here on the back. And that, uh, that should be adjusted so that the helmet fits snugly but not uncomfortably tight. And the straps should be snug enough that it holds it in place on your head. Because of course in a crash if the helmet comes off it's not doing you any good. So. That's all for the safety, uh, the, the little safety lecture at the beginning here. So now let's uh, let's meet the bicycle that's going to be our um, going to be our uh, guinea pig here today, our little uh, our little test subject to demonstrate some basics of cycling safety. This is a mountain bike. This is a few years old. It's a not quite the most most current and up to date bike. It's not a real fancy bike, but it's a good quality one. It's a decent, well made bicycle from a from a uh, a good company and um, it's been a little bit neglected I think it sat outdoors some and suffered a little sun damage and uh, and so on and it has a few things that could use a little bit of attention but nothing major and so it's going to give us an opportunity to demonstrate a number of simple repairs and some adjustments and things like that and I might also add just as a practical note we're going to slip in the odd little practical tip on bicycling here I've become a big fan of bicycling for transportation. I sort of started as a sport bicyclist. I've raced, I've toured, um, but I also ride pretty much daily for most of my around town transportation. And um, there are some wonderful new bicycles being made just for riding for transportation. Some of the major companies are making really lovely bikes designed just for that. But if you're not rich enough to buy one of those really nice new bicycles, an older mountain bike like this one can make a great transportation bike. The upright handlebars give you a nice position to look around. It's got very powerful brakes. It's got sturdy wheels that are good for dealing with rough pavement and potholes and things like that. So it makes a very nice transportation bike. If I was going to ride one for transportation, I would probably change to a smoother road type tire instead of the big knobbies because that rolls a little easier. And I would add a luggage rack on the back of the bike. And those are the two main changes that I would make. And then you might also, if you're going to at all ride at night, you would certainly add lights to the bike. And if you want to be able to ride in bad weather, fenders are also really nice. But just 
little better tires and a luggage rack and you've already got a pretty good transportation bike out of a mountain bike like this. So this bike has derailleur gears, meaning this kind of complicated arrangement for shifting gears back here at the back. It has quite powerful brakes on it that work very nicely and we'll show a little bit about adjusting those. And the first thing we're going to get into though is probably the single most frequent repair that anyone needs to make on a bicycle and that would be um, and that would be how to fix a flat tire and that's not a terribly difficult thing to do it doesn't take a great deal in the way of specialized equipment but it does take a little bit uh, this bicycle doesn't actually have a flat tire but we're going to let the air out of the tire to uh, to simulate a flat tire and uh, and then we're going to talk about how you how you would change that so let's first Let's pretend that we have a flat tire. This bicycle has what are called Schrader valves. These valves, the valve core is recessed uh, in there. And so if I wanted to let air out of it, I have to poke a little tool in there. We're gonna pause for just a second. Okay, so we've got a bicycle here that uh, I've let the air out of this one. This didn't really have a flat tire, but I've let the air out so that the tire is quite soft. I've let most of the air out of that. And we're going to um, we're going to do what you would need to do to fix a flat tire. First off, if you're going to be able to fix a flat out on the roadside, and of course this is this is really nice for if a person who wants to be independent. Bicycle tires do get the occasional flat. They're not as sturdy as car tires, so relatively small things can cause a flat. And if you don't want to be calling for help every time you have a flat tire, it's nice to have the basics of being able to fix it. The first thing is you need some simple supplies with you to be able to do that. So this is off of one of my own bicycles, and this is how I carry the supplies I need for fixing a flat. And this goes underneath the seat of the bicycle, tucked back here. And in here, I have just a few simple things. I have a patch kit, even though I don't plan on using the patch kit out on the roadside. Patching tubes out on the roadside is really not ideal because sometimes patching doesn't always work, it takes time, things like that. So I have the patch kit as an emergency backup, but I would prefer not to use it out on the roadside. I have a couple of tire irons, which I will use to remove the tire from the rim, and I have a spare tube which I like to carry inside an old sock. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One is that it protects the tube against abrasion from the other things that you're carrying in the bag with it, so those don't rub and wear on the tube, it keeps it protected. And also the sock itself will come in handy a little later on, and we'll demonstrate, uh, we'll demonstrate that in a moment. So this is a little array of stuff that I carry with me. The other thing that you need to have is you need a pump and these this is a pump designed to be carried on the frame of the bicycle and um, there's a variety of models that you can get you can also get little things that are co2 inflators they have a little co2 capsule that's used to inflate it but i'm much more of a fan of carrying a regular pump myself and you need to make sure that the pump that you have matches the the valves on your tire and things like that uh, we'll talk a little more about that maybe in a moment. So, you've got all the necessary stuff. You've had a flat tire out on the roadside. And we're going to fix that flat. The first thing I do, even before I begin the process of getting into fixing it, is I'd like to know what caused the flat. So while the wheel is still on the bicycle, is the easiest time to do this, I will take a sort of slow rotation of the wheel looking to see if I can see what caused the thing to go flat. Now, again, this is we're simulating a flat tire here, so we're not going to find that, but what you'll usually see most of the time is either the glitter of a little piece of glass embedded in the tread or possibly the head of a thorn embedded in the tread. And quite a lot of the time, those will be visible from the outside here. And if you can find them at this stage, that's the, a really easy time to identify that thing and find what caused the flat. So you'd like to do that first, give this a spin. You won't always be able to find it at this stage, but quite a lot of the time you can. Okay, next step to get the wheel out of the bike, we need to open up the brakes. 
you'll notice that the tire here, and this is true on most bicycles, this one's more so than some, but on most bicycles, the tire is quite a lot wider than the rim. And because the brakes are adjusted for the width of the rim, if I went to take the tire out, the tire, the wheel out, the tire would catch on the brakes and wouldn't let it loose. So I need to open up the brakes. And every bicycle brake pretty much these days has a quick release mechanism of some kind that enables you to open up the brake. And that mechanism, the details of that are different depending on exactly what kind of brake you have. On this one, it's right up here. We need to squeeze the brake together and then we need to just lift the cable and cable housing out of its little holder here and now the brake opens up nice and wide and doesn't get in the way of taking the wheel out. Next we have down here, the bis this bicycle has quick release hubs. That means that the wheel can be taken out without any tools um, and Many people misunderstand and misuse quick release hubs, and I've seen many cases where people basically try to turn this assembly like it was a wrench to tighten the hub, and that's not what you do. There's a cam inside this head of the quick release mechanism, and when you swing this across, it opens up and releases it. You swing it back the other way, and it tightens and closes it. Okay, so we have the quick release locked in place, we have the quick release open. And then there's an additional step these days because for that very reason that a lot of people don't use a quick release properly, there have been catastrophic crashes where a front wheel falls out because it wasn't properly tightened. So now modern bicycles have little tabs on the end of the fork. You know, maybe see them better when the wheel is out, but there's little tabs here that prevent the wheel from coming out if the quick release isn't properly tightened. So in order to get past those little tabs, I need to loosen this little nut on the other side of the thing, and now it can drop out. Here again, you can get a better view of those, those little tabs there that help to hold the wheel in place. So now I have got the wheel out, and if the tire has not gone completely flat, a lot of times when you have a flat out on the roadside, it may be that the tire has gone too soft to ride on, but isn't completely flat, in which case you'll want to let the last little bit of air out of there. Uh, that usually will require taking some kind of a tool or pointed object. If you have a, what's called a Schrader valve, this kind of valve, that will require poking something in there and pushing down on the valve core to get that last little bit of stuff out. So now I've emptied the last bit of air out of the tire. And the next thing I want to do, if the tire has been on the wheel very long, there will usually, the tire will usually have stuck to the rim. It will have sort of adhered to the rim. This one actually is pretty loose, but a lot of times it will, it will have stuck. And you want to go around and go all the way around both sides of the tire and loosen that away from the rim just by pushing it with your thumb so that it's free. Go around on both sides and do that. Then we take our tire iron and you hook it under the bead of the tire and you bring it around and you hook it to a spoke. That holds that tire iron nicely in place so that you can then move over a few inches and take your other tire iron, your second one, and pull a little more tire up. And after you've gotten a little bit up like this, then everything loosens up and you can just slide it around real nicely and everything. We've now gotten one whole side of the tire off of the rim. Um, this, by the way, individual tire and rim combinations can fit really differently. We have the good luck today that this is a very easy fit. It's a very relaxed fit. Some tire and rim combinations are, you, it takes a little more force to get them off, a little more care. You have to be a little more patient with them. So, now we're going to go ahead and take the tire the rest of the way off and we're going to extract the tube from the tire. Ah, we have a little complication here. Some smart person has inserted a puncture protecting thing in the tire, which unfortunately has kind of gotten old and worn. I think we can make it work. 
but it's uh, it's a little bit uh, just from age. It has gotten kind of brittle and uh, doesn't work quite as well as it would have. So what I would do next, I think we're going to take that all the way out and, uh, and worry about putting it back in in a minute. What I would do next out on the road is I would, even if I think I have found what causes the flap, I would want to, there's actually a little thorn sticking in there that hadn't gone all the way through. Um, I would now inspect the inside of the tire, and this is where my sock comes in handy. I would take and run this around in there because if there's a sharp object, a piece of glass or the tip of a thorn, I would rather find it with the sock than with my fingertip. And I'm going to run that sock around there in there to see if it catches on anything. So if there's anything sharp sticking through, the sock is probably going, it's probably going to catch on that sock. And just run around and I don't feel anything in there. The point is, that if you put a new tube into the tire and it, um, if whatever caused the original tube to go flat is still in there, you're going to get another flat. So you want to make sure that you removed whatever caused the tire to go flat before you put things back together again. Now this, I really think, is probably so deteriorated that trying to put it back in isn't going to work very well. So when you remove the remaining fragments of it, And we're going to reassemble our tire. So, now, many tires have a direction that they go, and you will usually see an arrow somewhere on the side of the tire to indicate that direction. And here we go, and this, it's hard to see it because it's faint, but there is an arrow there that shows that that's the direction the tire should roll. So I'm going to, let's see. So I'm going to put that in there, put that arrow in the right way. On road tires, that hardly matters. Now, if we were putting a completely new tube in here, we're not putting a new tube in because this one really doesn't have a flat, but if we were putting a completely new tube in, um, I would want to add a little bit of air to it to get it to the point where it had just a little bit of shape to it because that's actually um, it's actually when a tube comes out of the box it's totally flat and you'd really like to add just a little air to it before you start putting it together because having a little shape gives it uh, makes it a little easier and I almost forgot a step here the other thing I would like to do before I start putting things back together is I want to go around and inspect the rim tape or rim strip that's on here. This has some tape that's been put on here and that works okay. Um, and uh, that's to protect the tube from the heads of the spokes that poke through the wheel here. So these, uh, these, the tips of the spokes come through here, those are rough edges and those would puncture a tube if they weren't covered. So. So there's this tape or rubber strip that's on there. You want to make sure that that's intact. And, oops, it's the right direction. Now, we find the valve hole in the rim. And if we go around, we put the tire back in, excuse me, put the tube back in, and we want to make sure that as much as possible the tube is within the rim uh, there. And then we come to the part where the valve is, make sure that the valve is as straight as it can be, not cocked off to one side, because this is the time when you can adjust that. And then we put the edge of the tire, the bead of the tire, over the rim, and we start working our way around with our fingers. And you would very much like, this one's going to be easy for us, 
but some are much harder. You would very much like to put this together without using the tire irons to put it back together because when you use the tire irons, there's a high risk of pinching the tube in there and damaging the tube as you're putting it back together. So you'd like to do this with just your hands. This one is really easy because it's a very relaxed fit. Some tire and wheel combinations, it's much harder to get it over there. And oftentimes with a harder one, you get to about this point and it's taken a lot of force and you really have a hard time getting it over there. And if that happens, one of the things you can do to make that a little easier, set it down like so, come back here, pinch the sides of the tire together and kind of stretch them as you go around and that can help you help to buy you a little slack over here on the other side and make it easier to push that on. So now we have gotten that on and normally out on the roadside I would be using a frame pump like the one I showed to do that but all of my frame pumps are a different are for a different kind of valve so I'm going to use my floor pump here. I will add that if you're someone who's going to ride a bicycle regularly, it's really worth it to invest in a floor pump like this to have at home because it's very handy for keeping your tires properly inflated and bicycle tires should be pumped up fairly often. They, require, they lose a little air all the time so they need to be pumped up more often than car tires. And so I put just a little air in here and I go around again and I give the thing a little spin and I make sure that the tire is sitting evenly on the rim. So again, this point with just a little air, this is when you can easily do that, when you can make small changes in that. Everything's sitting pretty evenly there. So I'm gonna go ahead and properly inflate it. And once again, another useful piece of information written on the side of the tire will be the pressure. So this one says anywhere from 40 to 65 pounds per square inch is what the uh, what the proper pressure should be. So I would normally aim for something about in the middle of that range, around 50 PSI, and I have this nice pump that has a built-in gauge on it that makes it easy to get it to just the pressure I want. This is much easier to do this with the floor pump than it would be with the little pump on the frame. Release that. And I go to put the wheel back in. Now, remember that we loosen this little nut over here to take it out. So we're going to have to tighten that up a few turns to put things back in. And a good gauge on the quick release is that when the quick release the very first resistance that you should get as you go to close the quick release handle, just the first hint of resistance when it's about straight out like this, and then it should take a pretty firm pressure, but not an extreme pressure, to push it back in, and now it's back in place. And then we have to close up the quick release on our brakes, get the brakes back in working order so this just gets hooked back into there. There we go. And now test the brakes to make sure, yep, everything works. And we're back in action again and ready to roll. So that's our, that's the basics of fixing a flat on the bicycle. Now, the other thing that I think is the next thing to demonstrate is how to take the rear wheel out because the rear wheel is a little trickier to take out than the front. So we'll just take a moment to demonstrate that. The rear quick release, you don't have to worry about any of those little tabs on there because they didn't make provision for that on there. And we have to once again do brake quick release. And this brake is adjusted tightly enough that the quick release is a little difficult to do, but there we go. So when you're gonna take the rear wheel out, you want to make sure that the chain is on the smallest cog on derailleur gears here. Much easier to 
get the wheel out and back in again if the chain is on the smallest cog. So you see that. So as it happens, this has a little problem that we're going to repair in a minute here. And the chain will only be on the smallest cog on this bicycle, so I don't have to adjust it there. We're going to fix that in a moment. And the, um, but if it wasn't, I would adjust it that way. I release the quick release. I pull back on the derailleur mechanism a little bit, and then the wheel comes out. So now we have the back wheel out, and if we needed to repair the flat, we'd be ready to do that. Now to put it back in again, you need to get it between the two parts of the chain. So, so you've got chain above it and chain below it, and then you hook the chain back onto that smallest cog again, and you and you pull back on the derailleur and you slide it up into place and then it has to kind of work backwards a little bit and come up into this slot here. This is called the rear dropout on the fork. This right here, that's where the axle is going to go back in. So you pull it up, pull it up into there and then close your quick release, get the brake back into its operating configuration again and we are ready to go. All right, so now this bicycle, as I say, I think it sat out in the sun or something like that, and it suffered sun damage to, the, um, to this uh, housing around the rear derailleur cable, and so the rear derailleur, as a result, doesn't work. And so we're going to change this housing and I think we probably are also going to looks like the cable itself has separated a fair bit so I have a uh, spare cable here and we're going to change that cable also so this gets to sort of the first of the most common uh, specialized tools or somewhat specialized tools that you need to have for a bicycle and that is some allen keys allen wrenches the two most common sizes by far that you're going to encounter on a bicycle are five and six millimeters. So getting a five millimeter and a six millimeter Allen wrench, and there are occasionally other sizes. Like I think this, uh, these, uh, these would be uh, rear uh, uh, mounts for a luggage rack, and those are a four millimeter. And probably if I took this cover off, I would find an eight millimeter underneath there. So getting a, uh, getting a little set of metric Allen wrenches is a really handy thing to do. So, we're going to demonstrate replacing a cable and a piece of cable housing here. So the first thing I'm going to do is, this is the little pinch bolt that holds the cable in place. Let me say just a general comment to one of the really cool things about bicycles compared to cars is that most of the working parts are out in the open. You can see them. They're not hidden away inside housings and things like they are on cars. And so generally, if something doesn't work, a person with just a little bit of sense and a little bit of patience can usually look at the thing and say, oh, I see why it's not working. And, uh, and you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on there. So you can see that we've got the, your derailleur doesn't work and we've got this problem where the housing has failed. So we're going to release this pinch bolt that holds the cable in place. And we're going to pull this loose remove this damaged cable housing and I actually think on closer inspection I think the cable itself is fine so I don't think we need to change the cable but we're going to look a little bit at what would happen if you did need to change the cable I think the cable is threaded all the way up through all this long housing and it comes all the way up and up to this uh, this mechanism right here and you would these are ones I'm not familiar with so I'm going to have to investigate how I would uh, how I would do this if I needed to do it because this doesn't match any of the bicycles that I have. So I think we're gonna 
I'm going to skip that part right now. This is me not having prepared quite sufficiently for this part of it, but uh, because again, I don't have twist grip shifters like this on any of my bikes. So we're going to I'm going to leave that cable alone, and we're just going to change this cable housing. So I have this chunk of spare cable housing, and we're going to fit this in here so that it has a nice smooth curve. We don't want a whole lot of extra length, but we want enough that it... Uh, that it uh, doesn't make a real tight bend. And we're going to cut that with a good pair of wire cutters. And we're going to lubricate our cable a little bit because it will flow much more easily through there. It has a little lubricant on it. light grease, not a real heavy grease. Feed that through the cable housing. Clear something a little bit in here. this through the cable housing. Let's stop the camera here. Okay, so we peel back this little bit of rubber cover here and we slide the cable into this twist grip and it has to be kind of fed through all the different stages so we bring it into here push that cable down in there push the little rubber cover back into place now we have to feed it into this second stage of the housing and that goes in right there and a little tiny barrel off of that fell loose. And we want to recapture that. This is a little thing that goes here. You want to make sure that you just sort of put back in all the things that come out. And where was our housing that came off of this? I think that was this piece here. Yep. And so, This is our housing. Too many bits and pieces lying about. So we're going to feed this back into the housing. And when we get to the point where the amount of cable that's left uncovered here is about equal to the amount of the housing, I'm going to put a little tiny bit of a light grease on my fingertip and I'm just going to along there. Let's bring the housing up the rest of the way and that slips nicely back into place and then I bring this around here. Every arrangement is slightly different. Different bicycles are different in the way they arrange these things. This is a pretty common one though, a piece of cable housing that goes from the lever down to the uh, down to a holder on the frame. Then you have a section that doesn't have any housing and then we have to pass the cable. This is hard to see on camera, but there's a little plastic uh, holder underneath the frame that the cable passes through. It comes back to here. Now we're going to get our new piece of cable housing that we're putting in here. And again, we're going to 
extricate this little bit of cable so that everything flows, everything uh, runs smoothly and easily. Just the part of it that's going to be inside the housing. And we slip the cable through there. Let's go in the other way. I think that'll look a little bit better. There we go. Nicely in place, right there. And then we slip this in through here. And now we need to fit this into the pinch bolt that holds it in place. A little cover there that holds the cable. And we tighten that down. And now our cable is locked back into place. And we have successfully replaced both the cable and this little bit of cable housing that's here. Now we get to do the fun part which is adjusting the derailleur and getting everything working properly again. And I think before I do that, just for fun, I'm going to, uh, we're going to demonstrate some things about the chain. Because it would be nice to have all of that in good order before we start. The bicycle chain is really the heart and soul of your drive system. All the strain that you put on the pedals and all that work gets transmitted through this little chain to the rear wheels. And so making sure your chain is in good order is really important to do. I'm going to make you know, this a little easier if I change one gear here and get this up onto a bigger car. Okay, there we go. So, um, chains wear. Chains wear out. They're made up of all these little pieces held together with little pins along the way here. And all of those little parts of the mechanism wear over time as you use the chain. And here's the interesting part. The chain fits very nicely onto these cogs back here at the back. As the chain wears, the spacing changes. And the, each of these little segments gets minutely longer, just the tiniest little bit longer, so that it no longer fits properly onto the cogs. And when it does that, then it starts to wear the cogs. So you would like to replace the chain before it gets so worn that it starts to wear the cogs, because the cogs are much more expensive and more difficult to replace than the chain. And so you'd like to replace the chain just at the right point, just where it's starting to get worn enough that it uh, is about to begin wearing the cogs, but before it does. So probably one of the, if a person really wants to take care of their own bicycle, one of the good investments to make is a tool for measuring the length of the chain. You can do it with a simple ruler, measure the wear of the chain, but it's hard to be really accurate with that. Just to tell you how you would do it with a ruler, you would measure the length of 24 of these links. It's probably easier to measure that down here on the bottom. 24 of those links should be exactly 12 inches long. If you measure from the center of one pin to the center of the pin 24 links down, that should be exactly 12 inches. When it gets to be 12 and a 16th inches, it's time to replace the chain. If it gets to the point of being 12 and an eighth inches, not only is it time to replace the chain, but you've probably worn the cogs to the point where the new chain won't fit properly on the cogs and you'll need to replace the cogs too, and the cogs are a lot more expensive and more difficult to replace than the chain. So in the ideal world, you want to replace that chain just when it gets to the point where it's, uh, where it's worn enough to replace it. There are now there is a very simple tool, a very easy simple tool that's a little chain gauge that you can buy and it costs a few dollars but it's actually a good investment in knowing when it's time to replace your chain. This one's a little more complicated than most of those but it does the same basic thing. I put it in here and I do a measurement and this tells me that this chain is not worn out. This chain still has wear left in it. Uh, the measurement shows me that it's still good. Um, but uh, when the chain gets more worn, 
you want to make sure that you replace the chain. I think we won't actually demonstrate doing that today, but the tool that you would replace a chain with is this, which is a little chain press. It fits on here, and you would actually tighten this, and it pushes one of those little rivets out to, um, well, let's actually go ahead and let's do just a little bit of that. We can tighten this chain press, and what we're doing is one of those little pins that holds the chain together is being pushed out. Now you do not want to push that pin all the way out because if you push it all the way out you'll never get it back in again. Um, what you want to do is just push it far enough out that you can withdraw the chain tool and snap the chain apart. And the chain now could be removed, put a new one on, and for an older bike like this one I just snap it back together again and then I use that same tool reversed around the other way to push that rivet back into place. For a bike like this, a bike where the number of cogs back here on the back is about seven or less, you can do it this way and just push the rivet part way out, push the rivet back in, and that gives you a very nice uh, chain replacement. Some of the newer bikes that have a larger number of speeds, their chains are narrower, and it's become, it's become trickier to, you really don't want to try to do the pushing the rivet back in trick with those. You would rather, there are special links that you get when you want to break the chain, you use one of these special links and put that back in there. And having pushed that rivet back into place, it's a real tight fit right there, and I just move this a little bit this way, and that's now, now it moves nice and freely. And so that's what would be involved, basically, in replacing the chain. This chain is real dry, because it's sat around for a long time, and we're gonna lubricate the chain just a little bit and then we're going to adjust the derailleur. And people who are really into meticulous bicycle maintenance like to lubricate their chain with paraffin, and you actually, they actually melt a pot of paraffin and, uh, and um, soak the chain in that, which is a real tricky thing to do. But for most of us, the rest of us, it works pretty well to use a chain lubricant that comes in a spray like this. And what I like to do is run the chain slowly along, spray the lubricant on all the parts of the chain, let it sit for a couple of minutes so that it has time to kind of penetrate into all the working parts, which is where you really want it. And then I'll take a rag and wipe the excess lubricant off the outside of the chain, because you don't want that lubricant on the outside of the chain where it's picking up dirt. You want to let it penetrate into the mechanism and, and lubricate the more internal parts. So now we're going to demonstrate adjusting a derailleur. And let's see, where have some of my tools gone? Okay, let's come around here and let's switch places. Rear derailleur adjustment. This derailleur has what's called indexed shifting. There's shifting up here on this. It has seven separate little clicks up here. You turn this little thing and it goes click, click, like that, and each of those clicks represents one shift back here at the back. When it is in the position that's labeled 7 on here, this one's nicely numbered, when it's labeled 7 up here at the handlebars, that's the smallest cog. That's the highest gear back here on the rear. The way derailleur gears work, you have, in this case, we have 7 back here on the back. We have 3 chain rings up here at the pedals. So I think of that just conceptually. Think of it as 3 ranges of gears, a high, medium, and low range and seven gears in each range for a total of 21 gears. And they're sort of opposite in that a smaller chain ring up here equals a lower gear, an easier to pedal gear. Back here, smaller 
back on the back wheel, smaller equals a higher gear, a harder to pedal gear. So if your gear is a little too hard to pedal, you're pushing too hard on the pedals, you shift to a little bigger cog back here. If it's a whole lot too hard, then you can shift to a smaller chain ring up in front and make a much bigger drop in terms of where it is. So, in order for all of this shifting mechanism to work, we have to have the adjustment of this working properly. And there's really two components to the adjustment. One are the limit screws. These two screws right here on the back of the derailleur are the limit screws, and they control how far one of them is the high gear limit screw, and it controls how far out this way towards the frame the, um, the derailleur can go. And then the other one is the low gear limit screw, and it controls how far in towards the hub the, the uh, derailleur can go. And then the other thing that affects it is the cable tension. And small adjustments in cable tension can be made very nicely using this little barrel adjuster right here. And there's actually a second barrel adjuster on this one up at the, uh, up at the shift mechanism up here. So you've actually got two barrel adjusters on this one. And I realized that when I put this cable in, I didn't pull this quite tight enough, so I'd like to take a little more slack out of that cable before we get started on this. So, first step is I want to control this high gear limit screw. I want to set it so that the derailleur, if you look at this from the back, this little upper wheel on the derailleur should be more or less directly underneath this outer cog. So it's a little too far out, and I'm going to tighten this high gear limit screw so that that is more nearly centered. And that brings it to, that's a pretty good starting point. Looks about right underneath there. And I turn this, it turns smoothly, there isn't any extra noise, everything's looking pretty good. So that seems like a pretty good place to start. Now, I'm going to, as I turn, derailleur gears, you have to have the pedals turning to shift them, and as I turn it, I'm going to move it one click up here at the handlebars, and it should shift with one click, it should shift to the next gear up. And it does, just barely, not quite. So I've got a little too much slack in this chain, I mean in this cable, and I can decrease the slack by turning this little barrel adjuster counterclockwise a little bit. So I'm going to turn it just a tiny bit, and I'm going to repeat that shift still doesn't really come up, so I'm going to turn it a little more. Now, it's still not quite, I'm going to turn it just a little bit more until I get, shifts pretty nicely, goes back and forth between those two gears. Still need a little more tension. There we go. That's doing pretty nicely in terms of that first shift. Now I'm going to test how that's doing by continuing through the rest of the shifts. One more click, it should go up another gear. Another click, it should go up another one, and it does. One more click. One more, oops. One more click. And one more click, but I notice, see, it's, if I pull all the way back on this, it's coming up into this guard. And if this guard wasn't here, it would come over into the spokes. So that's a problem with the tension, the other limit screw, which is this one, which is the low gear limit screw. It's letting, it's too loose, it's letting the derailleur go too far in towards the spokes. So we're going to tighten this screw. It needs tightening quite a bit. Now we're going to test that again, and now it doesn't come too far in towards the spokes. It stays right where it should be. And now we come down, come down, come down. Each click produces one shift, and that's pretty much the way it should work. And so that's the basics of adjusting a derailleur. So we've demonstrated um, taking the um, demonstrated changing 
the cable and cable housing and a little bit of how you would change the chain, lubricate the chain, and adjust the derailleur. So again, I start off always on adjusting the derailleur with the high gear limit screw, the screw that controls out here. Then I go to the tension on the cable, which you change with this barrel adjuster here, and then work your way up and then test the limit screw at the other end to make sure that it goes up onto need it to go up onto that big cog, but you definitely don't want it to go past the big cog. These little plastic guards help, but many bikes don't have those little plastic guards, and then overshifting it takes your cable right in, takes your chain right into the spokes and can really destroy things. One last little refinement. Our, this cable is longer than it needs to be, and that's normal because bikes come in different sizes and things like that. Cables are sold at a length longer than most bikes will need, so we want to shorten this cable. This is another one of those things for a specialty tool. If you cut the cable with regular side cutters like this, um, you can get away with it if they're really good, really high quality cutters, but a lot of times it will squash the cable and cause the strands to start to separate and then it becomes a, a messy mess there. So I really like having a tool that's designed just for doing this, a cable cutter, and snap that and it snaps it nice and cleanly. Then, again, to prevent those strands from separating and coming apart, you can get at your local bike shop a little tiny aluminum thing that fits over the end of the cable push that up on there and then either with your wire cutters or this cable tool you squash it into place and now that is locked on there quite get it high enough up I actually am more used to doing it with this there we go and so that's locked on there now that protects the end of the cable so it doesn't fall apart so when you go in to buy a cable it's a really good idea to get one of these at the same time if you go to get a, uh, a shift cable or brake cable at the same time so now we've got that on there to protect the end of the cable so we've got derailleur adjusted pretty well let's take a look at the front derailleur and see how that does it goes down to the small cog that's fine comes up to the middle cog, comes up to the big cog, and everything works pretty well. Front derailleur is a little trickier. It's usually not as clean as one click to one shift because you need to make small adjustments in the front derailleur depending on what gear you're in back here because it changes the chain angle. And just a general word about what gear to select when you're riding. The gear that I'm in right now, the biggest on the front and the biggest on the back, is really not a good gear to be in because it causes the chain to cross over at kind of a radical angle, and that's hard on the mechanism to do that. So in general, you want to avoid that. If you're going, if you want that biggest one back on the back, it's better to be on your middle or smaller cog when you're doing that. And then the opposite is also true when you're on the very smallest on the front and the very smallest on the back. That's also kind of mechanically unsound, so that's a gear to avoid riding in, in general. And then just a word about gear selection. You want to select a gear that doesn't let you have you spinning the pedals with no resistance, but also doesn't have you pushing really hard on the pedals. You want to select a gear that lets you turn the pedals at a comfortable cadence. And most sort of beginning riders tend to select a gear that's a little too high because they feel like they want to push hard on those pedals. As you get more experience with riding, most people will gradually learn to spin a little faster and select a little bit lower gear. Now let's just take a look at brakes. Okay. This bike doesn't need any big attention to its brakes, but I do just want to show you a few things about brakes that are worth noticing. 
when you go to ride your bicycle, it's a good idea to do just a little very basic sort of safety check as you get on your bicycle to get started. And let's just run through that in order and part of that will be brakes. First thing you want to do when you come out and get on your bicycle is you want to feel and make sure that there's air in the tire. The tires should feel firm, there shouldn't be much in the way of giving. Now if you have a gauge and you want to use that or you've got the nice floor pump and you want to use that, that's great. Um, or, uh, but just for most people's purposes, just feel, feel that it feels nice and firm, press on it. Next thing you want to do is you want to look at the brakes and there's a couple of things you want to look at. So first off, you squeeze the brake lever and there should be significant, when you squeeze that brake lever in, there should be significant space between the lever and the handlebar. At the very least, there should be the width of a thumb in there between the lever and the handlebar. Because if there's less than that, you may, if you go to brake hard, you may run out of braking by the lever hitting the handlebar before you get the braking you need. So that's a good sign. It's going to need adjustment if you, if you haven't got that space there. You also want to look and make sure that there's plenty of rubber left down here on the brake pad. This is the part that does the actual work of stopping. If that gets too thin, that's not going to do its job. So you, you uh, check and make sure that the brake's working properly and you give that a squeeze and uh, everything works down there. Front and rear brakes are both working properly and not too much wear on those pads. So those are the main things that you want to look at. And then also, again, before you go to get on the bike, just giving a quick turn to the pedals and making sure that everything turns smoothly down here. You want to periodically do a little lubrication of that chain to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that that stays lubricated. And again, you want to check that chain now and then to make sure that it isn't getting over. So I think those are the main points that uh, that we need to look at here, and uh, I think that's uh, that gives you a good start. I want was one last thing is that if you want to start getting beyond the stuff that we've talked about, you think you want to get into a little more complicated repairs. There are, of course, these days there are endless videos online that will tell you how to repair almost anything on your bicycle. Lots and lots of them on YouTube. The very best ones to find out there for people who want to get into a little more advanced repairs are from the Park Tool Company. Park Tool is the main maker of bicycle tools and of course they want to sell you tools and in order to sell you tools they want to teach you how to use the tools. So Park Tool is a really good, their videos are really good references for people who want to get into more advanced stuff than the basic stuff that we've looked at here today. And there okay. are always books at the library. That's true too. The library has a great collection of, uh, of reference books on bicycle repair. All right, I think that's it. All right, thank you so much, David. This has been, a, been quite an education. I appreciate your time, and I know the people at the library will too. Thank you.